Hi guys, this week we're going to look at, um, as the title said, screenwriting basics and bullshit rules. Maybe that's what it's called. I might rethink that. But so we're looking at the things that you need to get right. And there's some very basic stuff. And this has come about because I've been helping a couple of people have sent me some screenplays and I've been reading through them. I don't do this very often, but I've worked with these people before and know them from other situations. So I'm willing to give them a hand. And one of them has got a really good story, but the very basics are there. Um, one thing, for example, is if you've got your screen heading, your slug line, your scene heading, that's very, very bad. Let's go through that one real quick. Okay, so you've got interior, exterior. That's important. Are we shooting on the inside or are we shooting on the outside of a building? Um, where it is, the location, so it's, let's say interior monastery dining room, and whether it's day or night, there was only four times. Because what we're talking about there when we say day or night isn't a specific time on a clock. What we're talking about is the light. You can't tell the difference between 11 o'clock and 3 in the afternoon. It's day. Um, you can't tell the difference between 9 o'clock at night and 2 in the morning. It's night. So there's day, night, dusk, which has that whiter light. And I mean dusk, which is the afternoon, has, probably has a redder light. And dawn, which has the whiter, thinner light. So there's dawn, dusk, day, night. That's that's it, really. In your, that's just that's your slug line. Scene header. Directly underneath that, you need to orientate people. You need to give them a description of where they are. So if it's monastery dining room, just one or two quick lines. And the faster you can do that, the quicker people get into the film. Some people don't even read them. I've heard people say, oh, I just, I just skip over that. I don't really care which is stupid, they should read every word. You put them there for a reason. So quick and easy. So monastery dining room, a large room, oak table down the centre, 10 chairs either side, built in the 15th century, feels old and damp, something like that. One, one simple sentence. It orientates people where they are. So that's it. Now, the bullshit rule that that's going to be battling against is don't use ing words. If I can, I'll put up a little section here. Um, I think Unforgiven I'll use. Unforgiven is uh, the Academy Award winning script. In that, they start, the opening scene has an ing word in it. Now, why is using an ing word rule a bullshit rule? To say Craig runs down the street doesn't tell you the state of Craig at the start of that sentence. Is Craig standing still and suddenly runs down the street? Or is Craig already in motion running down the street? You could do it more like, um, you know, you hear screams of the crowd, people are pushed out of the way as Craig runs down the street. It's just as easy to say, Craig is running down the street using an in word. Having an in word tells you you're in the motion at the time, swimming, falling, jumping, singing. It, the ing is in the middle of the word. i um, in the middle of the action, sorry. So it tells you it's already going, go ing, and we're, we're getting into this action in motion. So an ing word is a bullshit rule, but you have to just be good at English. Make sure your sentences are engaging, they're written correctly. So don't throw away a whole function of English because someone believes or someone has seen some badly written sentences and blames the ing word. Um, don't describe what we can already see. Okay, don't in dialogue describe or have people describe a situation that we can already see. This is a basic. In this story, um, uh, someone was wearing a straight jacket. And one of the characters goes, that straight jacket there is for your and my protection. They wouldn't speak like that. You'd probably see the straight jacket and the person struggle against it. And the person would just say, that's there to protect both of us or something like that. You don't have to sort of go, those guitar amps over there, you just look at them and go, you know, guitar amps. Or you'd, you'd make a, you know, a, a little 5 watt, 30 watt, 15 watt or whatever you would say. You wouldn't point out to them and say, that's a guitar amp. People don't speak like that. So don't call out or 
or discuss what we can see in this sh in in this shot. You know, um, if a person's there and they've had an arm chopped off, you wouldn't say. Or as you can see, they've had their arm chopped off. No, you just go. That injury is probably caused by a shark, or whatever you would say. Don't describe what we can already see, or don't discuss what we can already see. Once we can see it, people just interact with it. That's how humans work. The bullshit rule that we're battling against is the we see, we hear. Okay, that is, it's got a very specific use, and people use it incorrectly. People put it all the time like they're, discuss, like they're talking to the reader. The only time you need to talk to the reader in that way is when you're not talking to the character. When the character doesn't hear it, but we hear it as the audience, or the character doesn't see it. You can write without it. You can put... The hear one is a bit hard. You, how do you put a sound in and say, but the character doesn't hear it? Um, you'd, have, you'd have to say, we hear. We hear the sound of a door, but Alison is so focused on her work, she doesn't look up. Something like that. Um, the we see, you maybe do the same thing. Say, we see the light you know, glowing behind Alison, but she's not aware of it because she's so focused on her work. That's what it is. It's for us, the readers, the viewing audience. We see it, the characters don't. That's when we is used. But to put, we see this, we see that, we hear this, we see that. that that's a bad use of the term. But it doesn't mean you can't use it because other people use it badly. Okay? Just make sure you use it correctly and you use it well. That's a bullshit rule. Other writing tip, geography. Once we've said we're in that big monastery, we're in the big monastery. Are we at the far end? Are we at the table? Are we sitting down? Quite often people will get us into a room. Yeah. Um, we walk uh, interior kitchen. Steve is arguing with Harry. And then let's get there and go bang, 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 bang. Like a ping pong match of dialogue. People don't stand there and talk at each other unless they're in you know, the House of Congress or Parliament or something where they stand up, make a speech and sit down again. People do things. They walk around the room. They pick up glasses. They put glasses down. They sit. They, they slump. They stand. They, they look away. They do all sorts of things. And they will move around a room. Right? But where in that room are they in? Not just interior kitchen, but where? Give us some geography. If someone's in the back of a shop looking at um, shelves and then somebody's standing beside the shopkeeper, is that meant to be a jarring movement? Or is it standing at the shelves, shopkeeper looks up and sees Harry come from behind the racks and says to him, hey, Harry, what have you bought? They say, think of your geography. Think of your choreography. A lot of people don't do that. They drop us in a room and then just have conversations. People just don't stand there and monologue at each other. And that's the other thing too. Dialogue is two people, you say this, I say this, you react to this, you react to that. Not two speeches. People aren't monologuing at each other. They have to interact. Another thing people don't do very well. The bullshit rule. Characters have to have arcs. Now, a person will be changed by their environment, and if their environment changes, they will change a little bit as well. But no one has these big sweeping arcs. Um, Jurassic Park, you could have actually removed Sam Neill's hatred of children and that movie would still be the same. No man is going to let children be eaten by a dinosaur. So you don't need that, oh, he hates children, but now he's gone through this together, he likes children now. People don't change that much. They may differ their opinion. They may, you know, but they don't do this big arc going from a, a misogynist to a feminist. They don't have arcs. Captain America is my perfect example when people say, your character must have an arc. Captain America never changes. He is always the Boy Scout. The world changes around him. People will grow as a human being, but they don't have these big sweeping arcs. They don't need these big sweeping arcs. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they may come to grips with their own mortality. They may have a, an emotional change, but they don't go from being a loser to suddenly going to night school and going to become a doctor. They might go from a loser to getting a job. These big sweeping arcs aren't needed. You can have them, but it's bullshit that you need them. Don't over-describe. This is just a hint. Okay? If we have seen this in our life, in our world where we live, you don't need to over-describe it. I have seen um, things where it was sort of 
um, I write a lot of crime, so I tend to read some crime scripts. People will over describe a crime scene. We've seen crime scenes where they'll say there's a few cops standing around, the forensic guys in their white suits are doing this, the police taper here, there's more tape around the door, the cars are, are positioned to make a cordon, uh, there's some floodlights up, the coroner's car is parked back, the police are behind the tape, there's some people over there, a guy's got his own phone out. They go into like four or five paragraphs describing it. Well, they could just, we've all seen crime scenes, we've all seen movies and crime scenes, I mean crime scenes in movies, We've all seen that sort of stuff. So you could just say, the body's there, two white uniformed forensic guys are looking at it, the tape cordon is up, a few people are standing around. Something very simple. It's at night. Yeah, floodlights light the area, making the rest of the area look darker than it should be. It's just a couple of little short sentences. We all know what crime scenes look like. You don't have to go over the top, like, we walk into a packed nightclub, music pounding. You don't have to then go in, um, you know, the, the floor is so packed that everyone's moving as one. The blue and yellow lights paint the thing green, except for a splash of red that comes on every offbeat of the... Don't over-describe. Just in and out, bang, quick. Let us. And if you over-describe, you may describe not how the person imagines it. And then suddenly they're battling against your description. That's not what a nightclub is like. This guy obviously has never been to a nightclub for me. Um... That's what nightclub, yeah. So suddenly, let them paint it in their picture. Give them enough, give them the Legos, and let them make their own house. Don't over-describe. Here's the bullshit one. You need happy endings and likeable characters. No, you don't need happy endings, and you don't need likeable characters. The likeable character thing is sort of going by the wayside. Most people have just sort of accepted you need relatable characters which has got no connection with likable characters whatsoever they they couldn't say they were wrong so they had to change the word to relatable every character must be relatable you can't have someone in there or a character that no one has ever seen anyone like that that's ridiculous people don't talk like that you know, how can you, you, know, you must be able to relate to them and say I know someone like that or I could imagine someone would be like that or isn't that interesting that's what they're like in Lapland whatever you must be able to relate to them as human beings. It doesn't mean that that's the substitution for being likable. You don't need likable characters. You don't need happy endings. People can have a tragic ending. That can give you that sense of understanding of their situation. It can even make their attempted journey feel so much more. You've got someone who wanted to achieve something so bad and they've exhausted all their resources and they still couldn't get what they wanted. I saw an outstanding uh, British film once, one of those high-rise council housing blocks. Um, this lady had a child, and just through circumstances, it looked like she was ne neglecting the child more and more, but she wasn't. She was trying so hard, so hard, and the situation was just piling in on her. And in the end, she lost the child, it went to social services, but adopted by a family. And at the end of the show... <clears throat> She'd had another child. And the only thing that changed is that she'd moved three floors higher in the apartment block. And that was it. And the end thing was, and she had another little girl. And I think the first girl, let's say the first girl was called Sue. And she goes, I know I'll never see her again, but she would have liked the view from this apartment more than the other. And that was it. This whole thing was about a good person trying to get ahead and society and her circumstances were against her. You felt pity for her. It was heartbreaking. And after all that effort, she was back where she started. Not a happy ending. Bleak as all. Get out. So you don't need a happy ending. The other one. it's We've done a video on this before. Is the show don't tell. It's a, it's a most common rule. And a lot of people get this wrong. They, they'll start saying things like, she thinks about... Last time she saw this, how do we know? Or they'll put um, a bit of, you know, backstory in there. That's good if you're a genius, right? And if it informs performance with that, that would carry the descriptions. The way um, Taylor Sheridan describes Jenny Ann. Go, go find that episode. I'll probably link it in the two little snippets you see at the end of this. Um... When he describes Jenny Ann about her being, you know, really pretty when she was a teenager. Don't need that, but it sets that up. You know you know what you're looking at now. 
but you can't say the person remembers reading that book when they were a teenager. How are you going to know that? You can't. And it'd be really bad to say, well, you could you could that, put that in dialogue. You could have this character, um, yeah, Mary say to Sue, did you ever read so-and-so? No, I didn't. This reminds me of that. And then this person would say, why? And then this person, the other person, becomes the proxy for the audience. And Mary can describe what she's thinking, which you know, can be clunky unless you do it well. Um, everyone has a library scene or a if it's a crime drama, they have that big whiteboard and all the detectives come in and someone just sits there and describes the crime and brings the audience up to date to the movie. Now, this person over here has done this. And this per so you need those expositions. You've got to find a way of doing them clever there. And to write, she remembers that in your screenplay is a cheat. Um, the other bullshit one is don't use transitions. Okay, at the bottom of every scene, go cut to, cut to, cut to, cut to. That's like in 1908. You don't do that now. Some people say you only have fade in and fade out and that's it. You do not put transitions in. You're not the director. You put transitions in when you need them. Okay, if it's part of your tone, part of your story, but don't put them in unless you need them. That's the word. You need them. The story will suffer if they're not in there. Okay, most people put them in badly. They think they're setting tone. Um, to use transitions, you've got to have, you know, if this is a tennis metaphor, to put good top spin on a backhand, you're really going to know what you're doing. Um, I don't play tennis, but I know people that do. Uh, same as transitions, to sort of do a crossfade or a, you know, he grabs this door, match cut to a fridge opening. That's all. I've used that example before. But those match cuts and those sorts of things, a director will do those really good if that's his style, if that's how he always does it. Gilroy does lots of transitional stuff. You can read a Tony Gilroy script, then you'll be 10, 15 pages in and realise it happens in another scene heading. He's great at doing these seamless transitions through a story. Transitions are there, right? Do you know why we don't have, um, you know, tools in screen running? You go to write a duet and look for all the tools you've got, transitions, all that sort of stuff. You don't have anything in there about goldfish or butchery because, you know, breeding goldfish and butchering an animal isn't part of screenwriting. All the tools in write a duet are part of screenwriting. And when people say don't use them, what they're saying is, I don't have faith in you to use them correctly. And that's true. And unless you know what you're doing, don't use them. But they're there and they can be used. Okay, guys, that's my right. That's my rant for the day. Um, some very simple tools and some bullshit rules. If you want to leave a comment, be fantastic. Subscribe. Hopefully that's where the thing will appear. That'd be really, really helpful as well. Um, until next time, keep writing. Bye, guys.